But I want to talk today, and I'm really glad that all of you guys have came, because I really feel like what we're talking about today is where the rubber hits the road. And when I was thinking about why I wanted to do this practice, do, talk about this today, this is the 10th year that I've come to this conference. And for a few years, I was just like kicking it around. A couple of years, I had a booth. And for the last five years since we had the Functional Forum, I had a chance to meet a lot of practitioners at this conference. And the thing that I see more than anything is we have kind of an epidemic in integrative medicine of doctors that love integrative medicine, believe in it, want to do it every day, but aren't actually doing it. Right? Are sitting at home, maybe doing it with their wife and kids or husband and families, but don't do it every day in practice. And that's not, it's not good enough. So what I want to talk about today is just like you said, running a profitable practice that's supportable for everyone. Now, what this isn't is lessons in value-based care, because that was yesterday with Mark Hyman. And I definitely think that value-based care is the way that things are going, and I'm super excited to talk about that with you today. But the problem is, like if you went to those presentations yesterday with, I can't remember the first name doctor, the naturopathic doctor, Mark Hyman, at no point, every, every one of their models was super overwhelming for anyone in this room to try and replicate, right? The one doctor starts with two years of writing a 60-page grant. Has anyone in this room ever written a 60-page grant? Do you think that you will ever start a functional integrated medicine practice if the first step is to write a 60-page grant? Right, Mark Hyman had to convince the Cleveland Clinic to do functional medicine. Does anyone else think that they could convince their local hospital to do it? Probably not, right? And even if you do, even if you do convince them, what are the chances of it working, right? Look at Continuum Center here. Look at Andy Weil Center there. Look at the center up in, um, in, in Minnesota, right? All of those were ridiculously funded by uh, someone very rich, and when the money ran out, it, was, it didn't sustain. And what I want to talk about today is like, what is an opportunity for everyone in this room to replicate and start doing it like very, very soon? You know, with our communities full of doctors that are starting their integrated and functional medicine practice as a side hustle, right? They have their day job, they have to pay the bills, their kids are in college, but they want to do integrated medicine so bad and they're just sick of not being able to do it with their patients and their community they care about. What is it like a guaranteed journey from here to there? That's what I want to talk about. Something that all of you guys can implement. Because the good news is, and I just want to share this. The plan that I'm sharing out now is working, right? There are integrative and functional micro practices, which is what we're gonna talk about here today, in like every little town in America. 10 years ago, in this, in this conference, there was a few practices here and there, and some, some were doing it well, but in the last 10 years, what we have seen is a growth of what we're gonna to call today the functional micro practice. Now, the one thing that we're gonna talk about today is I'm gonna use the word functional, and it might be annoying to people who prefer integrative or holistic or regenerative or naturopathic. But the truth about those words is it's 95% the same. And we are all a team. And the infighting amongst this community is ridiculous. And ultimately, we're much stronger as a team. And everything we tried to do, like I started a thing called the Functional Forum. It became the biggest media channel to this group. Even calling it the Functional Forum in retrospect, I like differences like, you know, the alliteration. And it definitely caught on, but I was really shocked to find very quickly that some people are, I don't, I don't think functional, like I'm more integrated. Okay, great, good, we're all in this crew together. So ultimately what we're going to be talking about today is a medical system, um, delivering care to a local community that focuses on root cause resolution, that focuses on lifestyle first, and focus on seeing the body as a human, as, a, as an integrated whole, right? You call that whatever you want. I'm gonna use the word functional. I hope everyone's not um, offended by my use of that. And I probably, I won't swear. I might swear. Let's see how we get into it as we go along. All right, so the first thing we have to think about is that you have to think, you have to plan what you wanna do, right? You have to really think about what is it? What is the vision that you wanna create? seen so many practitioners and doctors who are like unwittingly stumbling into the practice because either they're like, well, I'll just do it like the conventional practice, but um, I'll just, you know, give them herbs instead of drugs. Or uh, I'll start a practice that my friend has down the street, 
and just copy their prices and everything without knowing anything about their cost structures or otherwise. And so you have to, like, if you want to know where you're going, any roadblock will take you there. So the first canard that I want to deal with is insurance versus cash, right? Because if you came to a conference, if you came to a talk that was taught how to make a profitable practice as, that is affordable for everyone, the problem you think that I'm going to do is talk to you about how to build a how to build a clinic on insurance. Now, the problem with that is, first of all, I just spent my whole summer, last summer, railing against the fact that health insurance is a massive scam. It definitely is, and the more you look into it, the more you realize all the pricing in the background, the fact that it's all opaque, it's a massive scam. Now, if I came in here today, and I was like, I've got a secret formula on how to run a functional medicine practice on insurance and make it available for everyone. I could be exactly right. And you could take down every little code that I said and you could run it at home and guess what? The insurance companies could just change the game next, next year and your plans would be for naught and literally they could come into your account, take all the money and take it back into their account. And be like, James, I went to your conference and I built 99217 and it all went wrong, what happened? I mean like, it's not, I can't control that. So one of the things we're gonna talk about here in the beginning is if you're gonna build your practice, should you build it in insurance or should you build it in cash? And I'm just, I, would, I just wanna give you the pros and cons. Like, if you build your insurance practice, you can grow the practice really quickly. The barriers to entry are, are very small. You don't really need any sales skills, right? That's useful if you're a doctor, because they didn't tell you to teach any sales skills in medical school. Um, you have, it's, there's, there's established referral networks, right? There's reasons for people to refer into you, and you can work with wider demographics. There are more and more successful models, maybe. But yesterday, Mark Hyman talked at the Cleveland Clinic. They still lose money on the individual visits. They still lose money. They've got literally like, hundreds of thousands of people all working to make this the most efficient engine possible. Think about all of their HR costs, their sunk costs are all split between so many people and they can't make it work on the individual visit. So what help have you got with you, with you know, your little practice to do it? So this is why you know, these, there are some pros here and there are some successful models, but there are some extremely big cons too. It's a terrible foundation for entrepreneurship. Right? You could build everything perfectly, and then the rules just change halfway through. And look, it's not like the um, payments from insurance are going up. It's not like, oh, we'll start it now, and maybe in a few years it'll be better. It's all going down. Right? So even if you get it right this year, is that building a sustainable business? Like, if you have a five-year plan, what's the reimbursement going to be in five years? There's no way to know. Bizarre influences on decision making. Come on, like you know, this is the number one thing I hear from practitioners: is that the decision making on the doctor side, on the insurance side, and on the patient side, totally whack, right? No one, there's there's no reason to think that. There's overhead, you know, there's overhead concerns, right? 2.4 billion people for every clinician. Someone's going to pay for all of that. Liable to burnout. If there's one thing that we've created in our practice accelerator and through the functional forum is a place where burned out physicians can come to start again and to do something that's meaningful and to actually get in and do the work that they thought they were going to be doing when they came through medical school, which is sitting with people and getting them well, listening to them and, um, and, and working with them. So I want to spend the rest of the time talking about how to build a cash practice that is affordable because it is possible. Now, one thing I would say of insurance, there is someone in the room today that I'm going to reference a little bit because he's a big reason of my thinking in this world really came around from Dr. Jeffrey Glad, who's here. So Dr. Jeff and I both teach in the AIHM faculty. Um, there was this conference called uh, Heal Thy Practice that ran for, I think, six years. He and I were faculty on that from 2011 to 2015. Every year we would get together and really talk about you know, what was happening in the industry, um, and, and the practice, and, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reference Jeff later, but one thing about Jeff's practice, runs a cash micro practice in Fort Wayne, Indiana, right? If you can do it there, you can do it anywhere, right? And, uh, you, know, I'm like, you know, Jeff's more down on his own city than I am. But um, 
But one thing to say about Jeff is at the beginning, he did take insurance. When he was trying to make the integrated medicine thing work in the hospital, it took insurance, and he saw a lot of people. The hospital closed it down, because you can't make as much money getting people well as you can doing heart stents. And so they closed it down, he started his own practice, but a lot of people got to know that he was the integrated doctor. So maybe there is a short-term hustle there to work out, just make sure you don't have a non-compete agreement, that at the end of it, you can't take any of those patients, but maybe at the beginning, if there is an opportunity that comes like that, where the hospital's like, I wanna know what this integrated stuff, and you can provide that, maybe that is a good idea in the short term, but now, eight years running in, you know, in eight years running successfully in a profitable way, in a way that's affordable for everyone in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Right? If, everyone, if it's available for everyone in Fort Wayne, Indiana, it's available for everyone here. So, why the micro practice? Right? This is what we're going to be talking about today. So, we're going to talk about having a low overhead practice. This is what the micro practice means. It's the basis for any practice vision. Right? Whatever practice you want, whatever practice you can envision, you can start it with a micro practice. Even if your vision is that practice that was in the value-based care thing yesterday where there was like 25 practitioners, right? If that's the vision, then you can still build it off a micro-practice uh, starting point, the chassis. Because ultimately, the thing that I saw so many times is people would come to conferences like this, they would hear the guru, they would hear, oh, I've got this practice and I've got 15 practitioners that work that and be like, that's what I'm gonna do. And then they go and try and do it, they maybe even have enough capital to pull it off but very quickly you realize, now I'm the clinician, the accountant, the HR manager, that's the worst, right? The HR manager, getting all the practitioners in the, in the group to be friends, that's a full-time job. And you're still the main clinician, and you're meant to be the engine room of the practice, like making all the money. It's so hard, it's so hard, I don't wish it on any of you. You can get to that vision, but start with a super low overhead model, learn how the business works, build it up, be profitable, then you can employ an HR person, right, who can do all that kind of stuff. Um, it could be brick, or more, brick and mortar or virtual, and we're going to be talking about that. The, the infrastructure that I'm going to talk about building today works no matter whether you want to have a virtual practice or a hybrid practice, in-person practice or otherwise. Community-centered and supported, right? One of the cool things that we started to see um, when this micro-practice revolution kicked off People were practicing in unconventional places. Crossfits and churches and co-working spaces, all places with a low overhead where people actually already were, right? Where people were, people who wanted to be healthy already were. Um, it's efficient and it's technology empowered. And we're gonna talk about different technologies to, uh, to use today. So I'm gonna talk about technology implementation uh, a little bit today because there are so many benefits to using the right technology in your practice. You can keep overhead way lower. We're going to talk about the two main things that cost in overhead is, fee is staff and space, right? I'm going to suggest today that if you're one of those doctors or practitioners that is, is not yet practicing in this way, that you can get so far down the road towards having a practice without ever hiring someone, or without ever taking a space, and we're going to talk about how to do that. Automated processes save staff time. The model that I'm going to talk about today was not possible 10 years ago because companies like Fullscript, who by the way is sponsoring today, didn't exist, right? You talk about Bob Roundtree. Bob Roundtree spoke here last year about non-acute fatty liver disease and talked about what it was like to run a functional integrated medicine practice in 1983, right? There was no e-prescribed tools for supplements in those days there wasn't even hardly these supplement companies with the thing. He was literally like churning up his own roots and, 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 uh, and herbs in his practice. Like that's how sophisticated the industry has become now. Go into the room and see how many supplement companies are you know, coming for your business. The only reason why the model that I'm talking about today is, is available is because technologies like Fullscript and all the EHRs and those kind of things have evolved to a point where you can run a practice off a laptop. That was never possible, even five years ago. And so there are really no excuses for getting started, even if this is a side hustle. And if you already have a practice, and you're drowning, you don't have enough time because you're spending an hour and a half with every patient, and you're wondering where all the time's going, we're gonna, there's gonna be a lot of value in here for you today as well. Increased satisfaction. I wanna talk a little bit about tracking, like, 
no one's tracking their outcomes in our industry, and it's not really a good thing for us. Um, very, very few practices are doing it. One of the, the saddest and hardest things, I think we all know that the medicine that we're doing is super valuable for the patient, but no one really knows it and we can't really prove it. And it's holding back the industry. And I think that more and more ways that we can track outcomes and use technology to do that is gonna help the whole industry. Um, and, and ultimately, we're talking about scale and we're talking about making money. Like I know, you know, when the, when the first IFM conf, uh, survey came out a couple of years ago, you know, not many practitioners are making money. You know, making less money doing integrated and functional medicine than in the other jobs. And I understand that, look, once you, once you like Jeff Bland, once you, once you capture the virus, right, of functional medicine, you, you feel a moral obligation to practice in this way. But the truth is, unless we actually find a way to help doctors do this profitably, you know, the signals that get sent out when there's profitable, can I just have you move just slightly this way because I'm just filming it right there. I just thank you. <laughs> it's all right, no, I'm glad you're coming to the front. It's a good place to be. Um, is we have to, you know, that in economics, if, if there's a lot of doctors doing this successfully, it sends out signals to the rest of the doctors like, hey, come and do this. And that's really all we wanted to do on the functional forum was put aspirational doctors like Jeff and Shilpa Saxon and Kelly Brogan and people like that who are having the time of their lives practicing integrative and functional medicine and making money doing it, supporting their families so that other doctors will go, I want to be like them. I want to practice like they do. Because ultimately that's the force that's starting to happen right now. And the good news is this is working, right? There are functional integrative medicine practices in almost every city across the country. And how do I know? Because I literally got on a bus for four months and drove around this country meeting all of them last summer. And I can tell you that there is an energy that is happening. It's exciting. We've got these meetup groups all over the country. The infrastructure is really starting to build. Um, and I'm going to give you all an opportunity to be, to be part of that. If you haven't made it, and if you, if you have made it across the practice to get to a point where this is going to be sustainable for you for the next 20 or 30 years. So the strategic focus, we need to talk about implementation. Need to have clearly defined workflows, SOPs and systems and teamwork. If this is annoying to you, it's annoying to everyone. But you have to get it started. If you're basically you're venturing into the world of entrepreneurship, and you have to start to do this. And if you don't, if you're uncomfortable with this, just get yourself far enough along with the basics so that you can hire someone who can organize all of this for you. But that's what we're going to talk about here today. So what I want to do for a start is to talk about the top 12 tech recommendations that we recommend. Now, I see everyone taking pictures of the slides. I will give you my email afterwards, and if you want the slides, I'll just send them to you. Okay, so you don't have to be taking pictures of pictures. It's annoying, right? You can't even see that at the end anyway. I'm videoing it, and I'm going to put it on, the, um, um, on YouTube anyway, and you can watch it again. Right, so this top 12 tech recommendations I'm putting up here, and the order is the most important. And the order for this, when I was putting this together, I was like, if I'm a doctor and I'm sitting and I come home and on Monday morning after this conference, I'm sitting there going, yeah, it's probably about time that I started my own integrated practice because doing regular medicine every day after I come to a conference like this is soul crushing, right? So what am I gonna do in what order? So this is the order of stuff that you need. Now, um, so just think how far you can get through having a practice. If you were starting a side hustle tomorrow and you wanted to start that practice, how do you do it? So the first thing is you have to decide what the name of your practice is, right? You have to have a name for your practice and you want to grab the social media profiles. There's a, there's a uh, service called knowem.com, K-N-O-W-E-M.com and you can go on there and you can say, is you know, 36th Street Functional Medicine available? Oh, it is and it's available on Pinterest, Twitter, YouTube, uh, Facebook, otherwise. You know, these are just like, it's just like establishing your property, right? So you can do this again. All of these things, this is a thing that you can just do. Go to Nome, you can book all of these properties when you have the name of your practice, because that's all free SEO, get that in. The second thing is, you need a website. All of these things you can be doing before you ever start a practice. This is your side hustle, this is your evening thing or otherwise. The key thing that you need before you start your practice, I've seen people do the EMR and all this stuff, forget about that. You only need that when you get your first patient. The first thing that you need is a way to be able to take people from, I don't know who you are, to I want to have an appointment with you. Right? That's the first journey. 
Then you need, so you need a, you need a website, and the, the, the purpose of the website is to take people, to warm people up to who you are and what you do, and give them the starting point to book an appointment with you. Phone number and virtual front desk, right? I'm gonna put this, I put this as number three. Robin Burzin, who runs Parsley Health over there, $10 million Series A, three practices across the country, total baller. In eight years, like six years ago, I saw her here, and she's, you know, she's off to the races. For the first five years of her practice, and probably still to this day, no phone number. There's no phone number in her practice. Why is there no phone number? Because as soon as you have a phone number, you've got to staff it with someone to answer the phone, right? Why not have everyone just email you, right? You can get through 10 emails in 10 minutes, rather than a phone call, oh, I've got this thing, can you help me? Like, oh, let me tell you a bit more about it, right? Suddenly, if you're the one answering that phone call, you've just gone into free consult mode, right? And you have no, unless you have unbelievable skills, to try and stop that conversation without being rude, it's very difficult, right? So why do you need a phone number? You don't really need it at the moment, you can use things like a Google Voice thing, where it goes straight to voice and they can read all their things and it comes through in an email to you all transcribed. But you know, again, if you don't have a practice, don't have a phone number while you still have a day job. You don't want those people coming to your cell phone. Have a place where people can leave a message and you can get back to them, something like Google Voice. Email autoresponder number four. The email autoresponder is basically the center of everything. In 2011, when I was teaching at Eli Practice, I talked about the email autoresponder. Back then, there was like MailChimp and a few things that were just coming on the scene. The purpose of the email autoresponder is that when a patient comes to your website and they give you their email address, that you're able to tell your story in a predictable way every time, right? That, you, that all of you in here have an incredible story about why you've ended up practicing in this way, right? You need to tell that story consistently. You need to tell why you've broken from conventional medicine. You need to tell them why you practice differently. All of this is setting up your value proposition so that when you say, hey, book an appointment in the online appointment booker that you're using because you don't need a front desk person, 80% of people want to book appointments between 6 p.m. and 9 a.m. when they're at home in the evening. You're not available and open then, you should have an online scheduler. So the email responder sends them a series of emails that's predictable every time, and it says, hey, if you want to book an appointment, go do it. So we've had practitioners in our practice accelerator that are still doing their practice day to day, right? They're still doing whatever they're doing in conventional medicine, and they're like, I'm gonna start a side hustle on a Saturday morning. I'm gonna make four appointments available on Saturday morning from nine till one, and that's gonna be the start of my integrated medicine practice. And the only way that you can get an appointment is to book through my online scheduler. They use something like Acuity. That's one that we like, really easy to use. People pay, they make the payment on the website. You don't have to take credit cards or whatever. They prepay for their appointments, right? You can do all of this so far. Five, just with, you know, you have a day job. You're still, you're still, you know, you're just uh, doing on the side. And then only when things kick in, when someone books that first appointment, now you have to take some of these next steps because you don't need an EMR yet because you've got no patient data. You don't need internal communications. You definitely don't need supplement management, right? You've got to do this in order. Okay, so now the first appointment books. So you need a patient intake. Again, you could wait till they come in and fill it all out. Uh, it's annoying for the patient and there's things like, you know, there's um, intake queue, which is a really great intaking thing that you could send people to where they book an appointment to do their patient intake. They've got some, um, great templates for, for functional medicine. There's things like Living Matrix, which is another thing that you can use if you're doing functional medicine, but a patient intaking software. Seven, telemedicine. This is the number one thing, right? Again, 10 years ago, you couldn't build a practice without having space, right? You need to have a physical location to practice out of, so the first thing that practitioners would do is like, guess what, I got my space, I got my space, it's awesome. Now I'm gonna do my functional medicine practice. The first thing I did is got my space. That's eating away your wallet every month, that space. What if you could start by, you know, renting a space for those four hours from a chiropractor who's closed on a Saturday, or some other place where there's a lot of people that want to get healthy that have just been waiting for a practitioner like you in the area, and you can do all the follow-ups on telemedicine, right? Things like Zoom. Zoom even has a HIPAA-compliant HIPAA version now, but essentially, you know, there's, there's all kinds of telemedicine companies, and, and one of the things that we do in our accelerators is curate all of these technologies, right? I'm telling you like one from each category that we recommend, 
But ultimately, there's a million vendors out there, and you know, one of the things that we like to do is to like reduce the chance that you pick a bad vendor because that's especially important for the next one, EMR. I don't know, has anyone in here had an absolutely shocking time trying to implement an EMR that went totally wrong? Unlikely. It's an unlikely scenario that no one puts their hands up because I hear that all the time, right? Where they try and do an EMR, it's a three month process, they're trying to get across to do it, they're going from paper to EMR, the staff doesn't know what's going on, this person left, you know, all of that, right? But there are some really good ones now that are designed for integrated medicine. We recommend MDHQ, which is now Servo. Very easy to use, not if you're taking insurance. Some of the people in our group like Charm. Um, Charm has got some good stuff, functional medicine. If you're doing a direct primary care practice, we talk about elation, um, seems to have a lot of fans too. But there are a lot that are terrible um, as well. Supplement management, Fullscript, today is sponsored by Fullscript. You know, Fullscript has been the one dependable technology that we've been able to recommend through the whole five years of doing this whole micro practice thing, where we never had to recommend anything else, because it was clearly the best in category. It's free, you sign, up for an, you sign up for an account, and you can now make specific recommendations of supplements. And again, I just want to focus in, like, these technologies, you say, oh, how is this saving me money, right? The, the phone number, the virtual front desk is saving money, you don't have to have a front desk person, right? The scheduler, online appointment scheduler, is saving you money because you don't have to have a person in there taking the phone calls to book an appointment. People can just book it. They're doing it with every other thing anyway, super easy. Telemedicine, you don't have to have so much physical space. Supplement management, the number one thing about full script that I want to say is that what happens after the first recommendation? Right, if someone comes in for an appointment and you recommend these supplements, do they rebuy? Do they keep going on the protocol? Do they fulfill that protocol? And if they fulfill that protocol, do they do it through a channel that you can um, that you can control, or is it through a channel that you can't control, like Amazon, where you know I've been to an Amazon warehouse and some of them are in unbelievably hot places and they don't have air conditioning. So I don't know what it's doing to those supplements and you don't either, so I wouldn't recommend it, right? E-commerce, um, so supplement management is a great thing. So now you've got your first patient in, it's Saturday morning, you're seeing your first thing, you need to make a recommendation. Again, full script, zero cost down, you make the recommendations, you can choose to make money, you can choose to give them a discount, it's, it's really good and the adherence afterwards is really strong too. E-commerce, so, um, you know, again, this is probably where you need to be, right, to, to see your first patient in an integrated medicine practice. And pretty much all of this you can set up while you still have your day job. Uh, E-commerce, patient tracking, and internal communications. This is maybe, patient tracking is like seeing what people are doing in between appointments, kind of like a food diary, but not so lame, because with a food diary, you have to, first of all, you have to hope they do it, that they have to bring it back in. How many people cancel their second appointment because they forgot to do a stupid food diary, right? And they feel a sense of shame. They're already shamed and guilted enough. They're like, ah, oh, I didn't do the food diary. I'm not gonna come back. Um, so there's patient tracking, internal communications, things like um, Slack, you know, if you want to speak to virtual assistants or other people you have in your practice, but let's not worry about that today. This is this is what you need to get started uh, with with running a practice, and I'm happy to answer any questions about tech recommendations. But this is what I would call your technology stack. And so many practitioners, what we've helped them to do is build this technology stack. Don't quit your day job. Keep the money coming in, and then slowly start to titrate away, renegotiate your contract from four days down to three days. Now you've got a Saturday morning and all day Friday. Then those businesses fill up, the money code coming in, you can titrate away, and so eventually you never let the income drop. You know, you can go cold turkey and quit your job and then try and do this, but it's a risk. It's a risk because you might run out of money, depending on your situation. This is a situation where you can actually like make the journey from the practice you have now to do this every day in the most like de-risking that journey. Right, and it's been risky for a lot of doctors and practitioners as they made that sh and shift across. So I will ask you, if you do have tech questions, you can go to goevermed.com slash tech or goevermed.com slash website review. These are free services that we provide where you can come in and we'll have someone from our team um, work with you to see you know, what technology you have and what technology you need. It's a big thing for us because we really feel like this is we need to, you know, there's so many discussions happening all the time, there's so many vendors, 
and uh, we want to try and make it easy so you don't make, uh, make mistakes. Now the one thing that we're looking for, the whole system, like wh whatever kind of practice you set up, I want to talk a little bit about what model you choose. But the number one thing that we need when we're going to practice this type of medicine is time, right? Anyone who's tried to do functional integrated medicine in a seven minute appointment realizes that the most frustrating thing is that you run out of time, right? And if you don't have time with the patient, you can't really deliver on the medicine. So I'm going to talk about different models that you can use where you can have time to do it. Because the reason why you need time is because you're dealing with unbelievably complex patients. Look at this. This is from Living Matrix, actually. Over 50% of patients in the functional medicine report six or more diagnoses. The average number of reported symptoms is 30. Why do you think filling out the intake is such a pain? Because there's so many things to write down. Because these people are very chronically ill. Right? The average age is 44. So we're dealing with, in this community, we're dealing with the sickest of the sick. Right, conventional medicine by proxy hasn't worked. Right, conventional medicine hasn't worked, and so now we're trying to make you know they're, they're coming to you. What they everyone you know typically is the medicine of last resort. What I've been trying to do for the last you know decade or more is to try and put this kind of medicine first, right, so that we can avoid going down this this whole uh, this whole rabbit hole. So ultimately, we're dealing with an unbelievably complex patient, and that's why we need time. So I want to talk about. What, what way you should set up your practice if you haven't thought about this already, because there's three choices when you're doing cash. Fee-for-service, packages, and DPC, right? direct primary care. Now, I want to talk about what's the easiest to sell, because a lot of practitioners see the DPC or packages, and they think, wow, I'd love to do that, but I'm getting paid every month, or I'm getting all the money up front. To sell these two things, you need a sophisticated sales system, right? You need to be able to like get a patient and go through a process of having them value paying you cash versus <laughs> not doing anything. Now, DPC, I will say this: there is a there is there are models that I'm seeing out there right now where because in, in conventional medicine, direct primary care is its own movement outside of functional medicine that's happening in a big way, right? Direct primary care is happening, and I have seen models with a super low priced direct primary care like 60 to $80 a month, but then that doesn't include functional medicine, right? If you want to do functional medicine, that's the cash addition on top, but building a, a direct primary care practice where it's just conventional medicine, like we talk, this thing's about how to make it affordable, 60 to $80 a month is affordable for almost everyone in the country. If you think about the co-pays and other things that people are paying, direct primary care is a single payment in cash to the doctor every month that kind of puts you into their group. That's a low price. I've seen ones as high as $220 a month, but that includes more functional medicine you need to think it through. But you, what you really want to do is think about what's the easiest to sell. If you've never sold anything, you should start with fee-for-service, because the easiest thing to sell is an hour of your time. Selling a $2,000 package for six months of care might be a much more appropriate way of packaging functional medicine, because you can't reverse type 2 diabetes in one appointment. Right? You can't reverse an autoimmune disease in one appointment. It takes three to six months. So why are you doing fee-for-service? Right? The only reason why you would do that is because selling packages is not that easy. Right? You have to actually get good at doing sales, and that's not a normal skill for doctors. Right? That's not a normal skill for practitioners. You have to learn this skill. It's important to learn, but, um, but at the beginning, I recommend fee-for-service because the value to your business and this is the thing, like for most practitioners who are thinking about maybe they're going to sell their practice in the future, it's the other way around. Direct primary care, money coming in every month, you're now building equity in your practice. When you go and try and sell a practice and you've been doing fee-for-service, the doctor comes in and says, who are all these patients, right? Where are they? Are they dead? Are they alive? Uh, do they still live in the area? Are they going to come back into the practice? You have no idea. You have no idea, right? because they're just files on the wall. With direct primary care, if they're paying every month, then they're probably not dead. Um, so, you know, that's a guarantee, they're probably, you know, the, the continuation, but if you want to have a high value practice, direct primary care, it's also a thing versus, are you going to be a chronic disease specialist, or are you going to be like a kind of a primary care-ish kind of doctor, right? A chronic disease specialist doesn't really mesh very well with direct primary care, because you're going into the relationship saying you're never getting out of this relationship, which is not ideal. With a package, Right? You say, like, give me three to six months. We think we can, if we work together and we do all the right things and you participate in the care, we can reverse this condition and then we'll be done. Right? That's, 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 it fits the medicine that's about to be delivered. 
having an ongoing relationship with someone makes sense if it's primary care-ish, and I say ish because you might not want to be their actual primary care doctor for legal reasons if you're not taking insurance, but you know, having an ongoing relationship, look at Parsley Health, $150 a month, every month, $1,800 a year, plus the supplements otherwise, very predictable. That's why they can do a $10 million Series A and be worth whatever, $50 million, four years into the practice. Right? That is a doctor that sat in these seats six years ago and is doing that. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about functional medicine 1.0 and then we're going to talk about what 2.0 is here. So I call this default functional medicine, I'm going to call it the Western medicine hangover, right? And the reason why it's the Western medicine hangover is because we're just doing things exactly the same as we did in, in conventional medicine, but we're just having more time and doing it differently. So, for instance, why do we start with the most expensive provider? Why is it the system that the first thing that happens is they sit down with the doctor and do the whole intake there with the doctor and do that? Why? The reason is, is because in medicine, the way that it's been practiced up until now, we had to have the most expensive provider or the most proficient diagnostician there first because medicine was created in an era where disease, you know, trauma and infection were why we were seeing patients, right? And so you have to get the best diagnostician straight there straight away. If someone's coming in with like pre-diabetes, type 2 diabetes, they're not going to die tomorrow, right? They're not going to die tomorrow. So the first thing you want to think about when it comes to being affordable is does it make sense for the first thing in my practice if I'm charging cash, if I'm $300 an hour and it's, you know, it's an hour and a half from the initial intake, does it really make sense? Is that going to, is that going to put a $450 barrier in, in a blockage in front of my care, in front of ever getting access to integrated medicine. If that's the entry point, we're unwittingly creating massive barriers for patients to get into integrated care. Longer appointments and out-of-pocket costs go up. It's leading to affordability issues, efficiency of care delivery, accessibility, behavior change. These are the biggest issues around functional medicine. Like the, the early years of functional medicine, people were just trying to work out. No one had ever done it before, right? Everyone was just like, okay, let's just see what I do. People come to these kind of conferences, compare notes. But what we saw over time is that there was a lot of defaults happening that were just a hangover from the old system, right? Now what we're starting to see now, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a minute, but look at the Cleveland Clinic. How did Mark set it up from the beginning there? Everyone has to go through a 10 week, group visit, in a community, working on the lifestyle stuff before they, before they see the doctor. Because you can guess what? Two thirds of people don't need to see the doctor after they go through the 10 week visit. Why? Because what seems like an unbelievably complex case, after people start participating in their care, it clears up and it becomes easier. And they start eating right, they start sleeping well, they start exercising and moving, and they start, um, and, and, and the case clears up and it's maybe not as complex as you do. You certainly don't need $5,000 worth of testing to tell them that they need to eat a salad, right? <laughs> so this is, a, this, is a, this, is, this is something that I'm really passionate about because I feel like inadvertently we're, we're, we're putting these big barriers up in front of care to stop people ever getting a chance. Like, who here is familiar with the functional medicine matrix, right? Then, okay. How elegant a tool, right? To write out your timeline, to really think through the antecedents, the triggers, the mediators, to give yourself a score of how you're doing on the lifestyle at the bottom, you know, to see how the body breaks down in seven key areas in process. What an elegant solution. If the only way that you ever get to integrate with that is after a $450 initial visit that's only cash, like that's happening in clinics around the country right now, it's a problem. And I'm going to tell you for the rest of the time, I'm going to tell you about how we're going to solve those problems and how we're going to make it efficient. Paul, you want to pass around? I've got all of you. I'm going to give you all a copy of my book, The Evolution of Medicine, and there's something thing there. So I'll just have them pass it around now and then we'll, we'll get into it. So here's the current state of affairs in functional medicine. Average person, in primary care, people see 19 people a day. In functional medicine, people see 7.4 people per day, right? So think about what would be an ideal for your practice. If you could go from 7.4 to 12, that would be a 53% increase in efficiency, but it requires better systems and a different approach. So the first thing I want to talk about now is group structures. And I believe very, very clearly that group structures are going to be the way 
that functional medicine makes it to the masses. And functional medicine making to the masses has to happen quickly because whatever disease you look at, we're about to fall off a massive fiscal cliff with the cost of care because of these numbers. So I want to talk about these five people and what they're doing. And more than anything, like there are, there are things in here that you're going to be able to copy. And there are things in here, but we still need it. And I'm going to talk about innovation that's actually happened in the practice accelerator. So, Thank you. does anyone in here know all of these five people? Right? Okay. Dr. Warner. All right, so, Shilpa Saxon, right here. Um, actually, before we go into this, I called the other day with Dr. Jeff Geller, um, who is the integrated medicine for the underserved group visit guy in Lawrence, Massachusetts. What a legend. I had an hour conversation with him, and it changed the way that I feel about this. And I've been talking about this for four or five years. So there's going to be some really exciting stuff happening in group visits this year. I designated on January 1st that this is the year of the group. So I'm going to tell you why I'm so excited about it right now. OK, Shilpa Saxena over here, one of the best lecturers in functional medicine. You know, innovation comes out of need. She you know, is practicing in her practice realizes that she's about to have an afternoon where she's going to see 16 patients who all have type 2 diabetes and she's going to be spending seven minutes with each of them. Why not put them in a room, spend an hour and a half with them, build their insurance anyway, and just get them as part of a group, right? Does it once, falls in love with the peer-to-peer -peer support that everyone provides, ends up making group visit toolkit. Uh, you can go to the Lifestyle Matrix Resource Center that's through there. It's part of the ortho molecular booth. But she now has a reproducible system where you can do functional medicine on insurance on Monday, all the, all the codes, all the things. Like, that would be a great starting point for everyone. So Shilpa was really like the first person in functional medicine to like do this and start to popularize it. And she's done an amazing job in doing that so far. She was my client. Next one is Terry Walls. So what, how did Terry Walls do it? So Terry Walls is, <clears throat> is uh, you know, five years ago, Terry Walls is kicked out of the VA, mentally kicked out, if not physically kicked out, of the VA and the MS Society for giving false hope to people with MS, castigated by her profession. What's she done five years later? She's proved that her protocol is reproducible by doing it in groups in the VA. Right, so Shilpa's model is 16 to 20 people. It's a one-off appointment on insurance. One-off, it's just one appointment, right? Which has some benefits. Terry Walls's is a 10-week training, all in a group together. Key things from Terry Walls's then, key takeaways, always in the first group, start with purpose. Why are we all here? Connecting on purpose. What are we, eight o'clock? Okay, I'm gonna zip through here. Terry Walls, connecting on purpose. Also, she said that the person in the group that has got better is more valuable than even her, right? There's a group of 20 of you, if you have someone who's had an incredible progress, they are more valuable for the rest of the community than even her, even though she recovered from MS, right? So there's a lot to learn from Terry. So she did a masterclass for us in our practice accelerator, and this doctor, Dr. Lara Salia, took on that idea and made her own thing. She created something called the functional prescription. So this is a doctor exactly who I'm referring to, Monroe, Wisconsin, the cheese capital of America. Right, she's there, she realizes, she set up this functional medicine practice, it's going well, she's in the accelerator, she's set it up well, and you know, she's got the marketing going and everything, but she realizes there's a $450 blockage between her and all the cheese eaters in her community. And she needs to create a way for people to interact with the functional medicine operating system at a much lower cost. She creates a one-off group visit, $30 cash, 18 people can be in that visit, because that's how many people can fit in the front desk of her office, and what do they do in that hour and a half? They all fill out their functional medicine intake together. She learns it from Terry Walls, they do it there. What percentage of people do you think want to do functional medicine, right, if they have a chance to fill out their timeline and matrix? Everyone, it's so awesome. No one's ever taken the time to think through this, and guess what, in the group format, some people know more, some people know less. You have introverts and extroverts. And it's a great learning experience. There's great peer-to-peer -peer dynamics. This is Dr. Chanel Heerman. I put her on here because she's doing virtual group visits where she, she was training the uh, mind-body group um, with Jim Gordon. She's literally piping. Imagine we're all in a mind-body. We're all in the VA. We've all got PTSD. We're all doing a big group. And she's being piped in through a video. 
it's not exactly the kind of group visit that I think where the future is going, which is one doctor speaking to a bunch of people on Zoom, right, where they're all at home. But if you're going to build insurance on the VA, you have to be in the room. And so that's how she's doing it. But Mark, if you didn't go to his talk yesterday, you're going to be hearing about this, functioning for life. It's the group visit that they've set up at the beginning of the Cleveland Clinic. They had 3,000 people in their waiting list. They couldn't fill it up, so they're like, let's do some groups. 10 weeks, run by a health coach, a PA, a dietitian, different every week. 10 people, you know, 10 to 15 people together in a group. What he learned is what we've learned through all of these, is the power of peer-to-peer -peer is so incredible. Like getting, having people do lifestyle change where the only person that's helping them to do lifestyle change is you trying to convince them to do it in the appointment, and then they have to go back to their house by themselves, all isolated and try and do it. It's not reasonable. It's not working very well, right? This is working because now the weight of running your, the weight of the behavior change is not all on your shoulders or their shoulders. It's a community working together. So, I feel like group structure is where it's going. I feel like this is the way, like, you know, you can already do Shilpa's model. I'm sure very soon you're gonna learn about the functioning for life and how you can execute that, and there'll be step-by-step -step instructions. You know, in our practice accelerator, I've got you all, you all have a thing here about the accelerator. Um, this has been an incredible journey to create a community of doctors that are all learning to build these micro practices together. We have a special deal for you, you can see there that only runs through Monday. You can ask me any questions about it if you want. But this is six or seven hundred clinicians in our community. It's recommended by the IFM where we're all learning to build these micro practices together. But my one tip, if you want to be a leader in the future of functional medicine, learn how to do the groups. It's unbelievably satisfying for the providers. I, I interviewed a PA at, uh, at the Cleveland Clinic when we went and did a tour. She had never done functional medicine. She had never done groups. This was the most satisfying moment of her whole career, to do these group visits, to see people inspire each other to want to be healthy. I'm sure that rings true in the hearts of the clinicians doing this. So group structure is one way to improve efficiency. The second way is provider teams. So Dr. Glad is over here, I'll mention him first right here. Dr. Glad, the, the lecture that I would take from him, so Dr. Glad is doing his practice, cash fee for service, doctor, he recommends to see the nutritionist. Guess what? Most people aren't following through to see the nutritionist because it's an extra hundred dollars. So what does he do? Increases his price by a hundred dollars and includes the nutritionist. Now everyone does it with the nutritionist, right? So simple things like that can have a massive, you know, massive change on, on how things are done. Um, Robin Burson, Parsley Health, unlimited health coaching included with your direct primary care membership. Now it's like a certain time of the day, but like, yeah, health coaching, why not? Needs people to make behavior change. That's an important part of medicine included in the plan. Frank was like the guy, Frank Littman was the guy who really set it out where when I interviewed him four years ago for his practice, you know, in 2013, he's one doctor with seven health coaches in his practice, right? First appointment, you sit with Frank, from then on it's like 15 minutes with Frank, it's still an hour with the health coaches, people have a ton of questions, right? The health coaches, we're employing health coaches at New Health for $50,000 a year. There are so few jobs for health coaches out there $50,000 a year turns into like 25 bucks an hour if you can fill them up full time um, or you know slightly more otherwise. So talk about how to make things affordable. If you're the main clinician, you shouldn't be sitting there telling people not to eat gluten, right? As much as you just learned that for three days here, right? The lower price providers need to be used to be able to do the things that you should do. There are skills that you have that they certainly can't do. And so we have to get the provider team right. You know, Dean Ornish is a great example, but again, you know, Dean's, you know, six provider model and he's done so well with getting it out there. It's not easy to implement for an average year on the street. So, you know, but it is a great example. 72 hours of care covered on Medicare, otherwise two hours of that care provided by doctors. All the rest provided by the synergistic provider team. Um, we also have Susan Luck in the back, the nurse coach. Incredible, like imagine having all the power of, co of health coaching but with the know-how of nursing um, and it's super valuable if, you, if you're just starting out and you feel like uh, working with a health coach is a bit uncomfortable for you, go and speak to Susan, talk about hiring a nurse coach because you now have the safety of a really powerful medical professional trained in coaching, trained in behavior change. Um, can be a, a significant, uh, powerful add-on to your practice. And then Scott Shannon on the right, um, very interesting model combining uh, psychiatry, naturopathic, uh, naturopathic doctors, health coaches, and biofeedback into a, a new kind of practice. 
So I hope what I, what I want to share with you today is that, like, more than anything, I really want functional integrative medicine to grow. And ultimately, it can't grow if we're not practicing it day to day. Because every time you take a patient through it, news spreads. Because this is the future of medicine. Like Mark Hyman says, in 10 years, this will just be medicine. It won't be weird. But we're, as a community, moving from being weird to being cool. Right? In the same way that the tech people, like 10 years ago, techies were weird, and now techies are cool, because it went from something that was fringe to something that was absolutely necessary and an incredible part of of, of medicine and, and humanity. And so for all of you, I, my one wish is that if, if you've come to this conference for 10 years in a row like I have, and you've sat here thinking, this is the kind of medicine that I want to practice, and if you're still sitting there going like, oh, next year I'll start my practice, go back to those 12 tech tools. You can get so far along with your side hustle practice while you still have your day job, before you quit your job, there is a path to titration across. We've had hundreds of doctors do it in the Practice Accelerator. If you're interested in doing it, we'd love to meet you. Thank you so much for your time and attention.